Okay, lock it up. Here we go. Okay, guys. This will be picture. Picture. All right, here we go, guys. Stand by. Sound is speeding. Continuing 56 sample. This is take five. Take five. Two. Three. Sound speed. Sound speed. Speed. Marker. And background action and action. Please state your name for the record. Daniel Ocean. The script is such a smart script. All these characters were so well written. Everybody seems to have their own sort of showcase. We sent a copy to Julia with $20. He said, here you get 20 a film now. To work with Steven again, you know, I would do that for $20. Um, don't tell Jerry Weintraub. So, yeah, that was a huge lure for me, but I was even more pleased when I actually sat down and read the script and thought it was so great and so fun and liked my little bit in it. Are you kidding me? I'm going to go work with Steven Soderbergh and with the, all these guys. I mean, if, you know, it's fun to be a supporting actor when you really like the people you're supporting and you really like the story. Naturally, if you can get George Clooney and Brad Pitt and Matt Damon and Andy Garcia and Julia Roberts and Don Cheadle and Bernie Mac and Carl Reiner and Elliot Gould to work together in one movie. What, did you guys get a group rate or something? Every time you look at the screen, your eyes are going to pop out of your head. You're always looking at something beautiful, <laughs> you know, or you're always looking at something important, beside the fact that they're great actors. Crystal talk, guys. Quiet, please. It's too bad that he couldn't draw real talent to this film, and it's a bunch of no names and hacks, but I, you know, they're doing their best. The first time we all sat down, we read the script together, group reading. That was great fun. You could just hear it firing then. And to see all the guys walk in one by one, it was good, good fun. It's pure entertainment. We'll just pick it up from there. It's already going. <laughs> oh. Mr. Ocean, was there a reason you chose to commit this crime? Or was there a reason you simply got caught this time? My wife left me. I was upset. I got into a self-destructive pattern. While he was inside, he's been thinking, and he has a plan together uh, to pull a job. I hope you were the groom. I would say Rusty is Danny's right-hand man. I would say Danny's the idea man, and Rusty, he makes things happen. Danny shows up with this brilliant master plan. It's never been done before. It's gonna need planning, a large crew. What's the target? Eight figures each. What's the target? When was the last time you were in Vegas? They had this master plan of trying to rob the casinos. Not one, but... That was a three. Which casinos did you geniuses pick to rob? Bellagio. The Bellagio, the Mirage, and the MGM Grand. Danny has a lot of blind sides, and Rusty tends to watch out for him. But Danny can sell you anything. Why do this? Why not do it? Because the house always wins. You play long enough, you never change the stakes. The house takes you. Unless, when that perfect hand comes along, you bet big, and then you take the house. Been practicing this speech. A little bit. Did I rush it? Felt like I rushed it. That was good. I liked it. Back it up. Yeah. And who told you to do that? I did. I was concerned you couldn't leave Tess alone. Who's Tess? My wife. Tess? Ex-wife. <laughs> You gotta be nuts, and you're gonna need a crew as nuts as you are. 
Elliot Gold uh, is Ruben is financing this whole thing. What do you got in mind? I'm uh, perpetrating as a dealer in Atlantic City. You have a plan already? Are you kidding? I just became a citizen again. Brother, I'm in. You're either in or you're out. Right now. Matt Damon is by trade a sort of expert pickpocket. Well, he's been around the con his whole life, so he's, uh, you know, a jack of all trades in one respect, and then in another, he's very good. He can lift anything from anybody, so he's, he's, he's got very quick hands. That's the best lift I've seen you make yet. Las Vegas, huh? Waiting, sweetheart, just waiting. Good, go. Waiting for you. What do you want? Go, little girl, you're like a little girl. Relax. The job needs drivers, and why not too? Stupid white boy pecker with goofballs. <laughs> Carl's character, I always imagined, was like a woman who used to be asked out a lot and now doesn't get asked out at all. So are you sure you're ready to do this? If you ever ask me that question again, Daniel, you will not wake up the following morning. This is not cool in any way. He's the, the antithesis of that. He's very good at computers. And very good at surveillance. He's good at figuring out problems. You, know, you got so many cool people in the movie. I think you need somebody to not be so cool. D -d don't, 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 don't touch that. Hey, Radio Shack, relax. What are you saying about yourself? Oh, not about me. About Livingston Dell. I, I'm, I'm cooler than George Clooney. <laughs> Hang on to your knickers. Don Cheadle is the munitions guy. You know, he, he deals with everything that has to do with uh, explosives. You could just walk in and blow the whole place up and get everything, but then you're probably going to go to jail. It would be nice working with proper villains again. Ten ought to do it, don't you think? You think we need one more? You think we need one more? All right, we'll get one more. Yen is a uh, Chinese acrobat. I don't know, it doesn't seem all that different. We got a grease man. We got a grease man. As is always the case, everything's going along smoothly until uh, the woman shows up, and then it gets complicated. She's, you know, she's interesting, and she's a bit of a puzzle, and it's not, I mean, even, well, for Steven, I would just play the chick, but she's more than just the girl, you know, she's, she's got some intrigue behind her and some difficult crosses to bear. You're 30 seconds late, I was about to send out a search. Hello, Tess. I think that Tess and Danny, that's kind of a true love gone bad situation. Um, and with, with Benedict and Tess, I think that she doesn't know what it's about necessarily. Stay and have a drink. You can't. <laughs> I don't imagine we'll be seeing Mr. Ocean anytime soon, right? I never know. Ah, I know everything that's happening in my hotels. Good to see you, Tess. Take care, Danny. Terry. Danny. He's running an empire, really, you know, and he is, and he, he likes to be in charge. And although I think he's very gracious with his employees, he can also be uh, very ruthless. Well, he's the enemy. Oh, he's the enemy. These are Terry Benedict's place. Yes, they are. You think you'll mind? Went to someone. We were really lucky to get Andy. You know, it's a great role, but it's, it means that you have to come into a room of 11 guys who've been working together for a long period of time and like each other and get along and play the guy who nobody likes. It's hard to do. Tell me this is not about screwing the guy who's screwing your wife. Ex-wife. Tell me. It's not about that. Not entirely about that. Ooh, bells the bells are ringing. Oh my God! Esmeralda. <laughs> this one really is about the heist. I mean, the you know, three quarters of the film is us actually pulling this heist off, which is fun. You get to be in it and like watch us screw up and watch us do things you know, good and bad. It's, you get to you get to take the ride. The vault at the Bellagio that safeguards every dime that passes through each of the three casinos above it. We're gonna rob it. Coming up with a way of 
incredibly robbing a very large casino with a lot of security, something that makes sense and is entertaining, is was really difficult to come up with. Smash and grab job, huh? Slightly more complicated than that. Oh. Yeah. They're trying to knock over these three casinos simultaneously, which all share a common vault. And they're trying to do it on a fight night. Casinos need to um, have enough cash on hand to, to cover every bet at play on their floor. That means on a weekday, by law, it has to carry anywhere between 60 and 70 million dollars in cash and coin. On the weekend, between 80 and 90 million. On a fight night, the night that we're going to rob it, 150 million without breaking a sweat. And so their plan is to hit this vault that night in the middle of the fight uh, while creating a series of, of sort of ever escalating diversions. Someone call for a doctor? I'm not Sir, in your face! You are in my face! You bumped into me! You got you in my way! I was trying to deliver my balloons! Gentlemen! We're just supposed to walk out of there with $150 million in cash on us without getting stopped? Yeah. It gets complicated. Things things go wrong. Well, let's check the battery. We have a problem. They have to uh, scramble a bit to pull it off. Where's Linus? Back it up. So. It's me, Bucky Buchanan. Remember from Saratoga. We're gonna step outside now. Leave you two alone to talk things over. All righty. Ah! Basher, what happened? If you make one mistake, then the whole thing's gonna fall apart. Problem is now they know their weakness and they're sorting it out. They're fixing it. So unless we intend to do this job in Reno, we're in Barney. Barney Rubble. Trouble! This movie here is, is a big-ass heist. Livingston, we're set. Livingston, we're set. Basher, we're set. Hang on a minute, Chief. Everyone wants to see Vegas get taken to a certain degree because everyone's probably got a Vegas story. It's like the sting. You know, there's those sort of elements to it. And it's been one of those times where it's just been nothing but fun. Now, they tell me that I paid my debt to society. Funny, I never got a check. I just thought it was exactly the kind of movie that you want when you hear that, you know, there are movie stars and there's a heist, and it just seemed to really deliver on all the levels. You want a movie like that to deliver on. At the end of this, you better not know you're involved, not know your names or think you're dead because he'll kill you and then I'll go to work on you. It's a crime. We should not be getting paid for this. It's just been a laugh. <laughs> I'm supposed to be steely and serious, and I was, you know, laughing like a 12-year-old, and it was, um, yeah, I think Stephen was getting, I'm starting to wonder, why did I bring these two people to the table together? <laughs> it all stems really from Stephen's sort of the karma that he disperses as a director because the director is always sort of sets the tone. He's a smart guy. Steven actually is one of the one of the um, easiest people I've ever worked with. Steven lets us improvise and we'll improvise and improvise and improvise and then I'll find out he wasn't even rolling sound. I haven't seen anything he's done yet, but I hear he's got a future. <laughs> Any questions? Well, wait, so we'll put these out while I don't. Exactly. All you really ever want somebody to do is have fun in the best popcorn sense of the word. Everybody seems to be doing such a bang-up job. I can't imagine that it won't be spectacular fun. And I, for one, can't wait to see this movie. When they first start shooting, you know, and person first walks out in, in their costumes, if it works, you feel great. If it doesn't work, you don't feel so great. In this particular case, thank God, it, it seemed to work very well. And we took a lot of chances. I mean, we stylized a great deal. When I imagined the kind of films I was thinking of, I wanted it to be kind of, you know, sparkling. 
I really tried to avoid any kind of direct aesthetic associations with the original Ocean's Eleven. Those guys were the epitome of cool, and none of us wanted to compare ourselves to them. You can't beat that, so we took a completely different tact. We wanted to show Las Vegas as a heightened Las Vegas, not Las Vegas as it is now, but the Las Vegas that we all wish it was. It's just guys, the banter, bringing down the casino, a nice suit here and there. There is a famous photograph taken by Sid Avery of the original cast of Ocean's Eleven, and we thought it would be fun to recreate that photograph and have Sid Avery come and do it. It is not just clothing. Clothing is clothing, costumes are costumes. Costumes do something else. Clothing is to cover yourself. Costumes tell a story. Just like a script tells a story. Costumes are created specifically for a character as opposed to clothing, which is created for people to wear. Each garment, each costume, hopefully says something about that character, that particular scene they're in, and is working to further along a story, just like words are, actions are, and everything else. It's never off the rack on someone's shoot it. I, I don't think any costume designer works like that. Basically, to put Brad Pitt in clothes, how hard is it to make Brad Pitt look good? It's not, you know what I mean? He just does. But building a character with clothing, or helping to build a character with clothing. You're out, Danny. He's out? It's that or we call the whole thing off. The costumes take on a life of their own, and to see that happen, it's extremely gratifying. Rusty Ryan's character is a fashionista, shall we say. Roll sound. He was this guy who was teaching you know, young movie stars how to play poker. I mean, he was in a group where his clothing could be slightly over the top, and the colors were definitely there. And they were always very shiny and very reflective. And the fabrics I used always gave a sheen back, and there was a glow that came from them. He shines, he does. And his clothes are very fitted to his body, like racer-like almost. There's a good deal of speed. Everything about him is quick, it's fast. His wit is fast, his speech is fast, as you see him in the film. He changes quickly, he does things quickly, he gets it all together. God, I'm bored. You look bored. I am bored. Brad's fittings took hours and hours. Not because it was difficult, but because he was so interested in every nuance of the clothing and how it made him feel as a character and what I could do. And I was interested in what he had to say. And so those fittings were great because we learned so much about each one of our crafts. He knew better where he was going to go, and I knew how better to do my job. I think as far as clothing helping the performance, I think it helps a great deal. Um, I had sent Carl Reiner his sketches because it gave him an idea where I was going before I did a fitting. And he called me and he said, said, well, you've given me the character. I know exactly where I'm going. Yeah, I mean, he just looked at the drawings and he knew, you know, where he wanted to go. A guy who wears Hawaiian shirts and stained hats and eats Rolades, they dress him up in the most elegant clothes he's ever. This is one set of, look at these with the fob and the um, with, with glasses. And the same thing with Elliot Gould and so many of the guys. Trick or treat. Or did you guys get a group rate or something? Danny Ocean's character is a very classic character. He is the glue that holds it all together, and I kept him in a very solid kind of style. And the colors were also very much that way. There were darks and lights, uh, sometimes whites, but mostly usually pale grays to certain colors also. There's some jokes that come up because of costume design. For instance, I don't think in the script George walks out of prison the first time wearing a tuxedo, which he does now. So that recurring joke of he keeps on walking out of prison in a tuxedo just came out of Stephen and Jeffrey and George. Our thought was is that he was arrested for jumping bail once again and he was taken straight to prison and the suit they took him to prison in was his tuxedo. And then we ended the same way because you see him be taken from the Bellagio straight into the police car, he's taken back to jail. And so he's in another tuxedo. Um, those are chances we took visually that I think work, and they add to the character, and they add to the interest. You know, when you first see it, they go, whoa, this, this could be interesting. And he walks out in the cold with the collar up on a tuxedo, and, the, and you immediately set up the cool and the, you know, the certain style of both George's character as Danny and the movie, because it all radiates from him. That's where it starts. I mean, you see him come up the escalator in the, in the first casino. You see his shoulders into his legs, and then he walks off, and he's styling. Terry Benedict, as played by Andy Garcia, is a very interesting character because you could easily say, oh, he's the bad guy, let's just do him as the bad guy. He's the devil. Hey, he's the enemy. That's he's in the eye of the beholder. Rat. 
Obviously, this woman, Tess Ocean, sees something in him. Amazing, isn't it? You have to balance him against Danny Ocean. It's the same woman went for both these guys. There's got to be, as much as there are differences, there's got to be some similarities. So there's a certain coolness to him and, and power to him that you want to, to express. We decided that there was a certain Eastern quality to him, that he had to have a center, that it had to come from someplace, this cool. I had thought that a certain Zen quality or, an, you know, an Asian feel to some of his things would take the edge off of, quote unquote, the evil. And, and so I incorporated it into the clothing and, and also in the demolition you see the model that they're standing in front of, of the new hotel that he's going to erect is a very Asian looking hotel. And you see in his vest and the cut of his clothes, the cut of his tuxedo is Western in fit, but it's built like a kimono. It has no buttons down the front and it's rather solidly on him by itself. So there's a real kind of like <coughs> zen cool with that character. Pick him up. Ah. <laughs> we only have one lady in our film and we were lucky enough to have it be Julia Roberts. So um, the character of Tess Ocean is more complicated than one might think because she's intelligent, yet she's also the girlfriend and live-in of the most powerful man in Las Vegas. There's a part of her that is beholden to this man. So a certain amount of his taste is shown in her clothing also. So you're dealing with her taste, his taste, East Coast, Las Vegas, all of this coming together to form the physicality of her clothing. It's been fun. It's kind of like a glamorous part, which I'm not really used to, being so dressed up all the time, and the jewelry, and the gowns, and the shoes, and the whole nine yards. Jeffrey made everything, so that's been kind of like, it's my own personal Barbie playhouse. Matt Damon's character is inexperienced, young, eager, anxious, brash, all those things incorporated into a set of costumes. So I dressed him as a college student. Design for costumes has a great deal to do with the actor. So of course the actor has something to say about what they're wearing because they're creating the character. You don't want the clothes to wear them, you want them to wear the clothes as the character. So of course all actors have input as to what they you know, feel about and how comfortable they are as the character in the, in the clothes. And of course, as you draw, you think of that person and kind of style the character physically around the physical attributes of the actual person. But the character is the character. The character will always remain the character, and these actors were playing characters and happy to play them. And so in other words, I don't think they had a great desire to wear clothing that they necessarily liked. I think they wanted to play the character. I hope you were the groom. Ted Nugent called, he wants his shirt back. Those lines actually grew out of the moment and out of the clothes, strangely enough. They just came up with it. I mean, that's those guys. I mean, they're quick. I mean, they're, they're, they're funny and they're quick.